Welcome to a new episode of the Relentless CEO Podcast. My name is Adam Kiefer. We are jumping into the business side of running a membership business today and talking about revenue without bumping the mic. All right, so we're talking about revenue today and really if you are the manager or you're the CEO of your company, revenue is one of your main responsibilities. So the, the way that we structure it in our martial arts school is the manager is in charge of revenue, uh, the CEO is in charge of creating opportunities to increase revenue, which means my job as a CEO is I need to make sure there's always a steady influx of leads coming in so that the manager has the opportunities to add more billing and increase the billing month after month. Uh, if they don't have enough leads, that's my fault. If I'm getting them enough leads though, and they're not converting those leads to trials or converting those trials to new members, then that's on the manager and on the team. And side note, if you're a CEO, it's still on you <laughs> because you're the owner of the business. But I need to go in and address some things with the team, whether it's increased training in those areas or just having a conversation, whatever it might be, I need to address that. But today what we're gonna focus on is really how to drive revenue in your business so that it's sustainable uh, and you can scale it as well. Because there are some pieces of advice being given out in our industry that provides temporary relief for revenue, but can kill your business long term. And these are what I call false profits. And there's really three big false profits that I see in our industry. Um, and we're going to jump into these. And some of you guys might be doing these things in your school. Um, I'm not trying to offend anyone. I'm just looking at the grand scheme of things of what I've seen from working with hundreds of martial arts school owners and what sets apart the su successful ones from the ones that are high stress or high struggle every single month. So the very first false profit is adding more things to your program. What do I mean by that? I mean, you're gonna add a fitness kickboxing program. You're gonna add a weapons class. You're gonna add a new sparring class. You're gonna add a yoga class. All of these different things that require more energy, more focus, more specialty is what you're adding in. Now, a lot of those will provide temporary revenue relief. What I mean, what I mean by that is, at first, when you launch it, it might add some extra billing to your program. Okay, if you're if it's an upgrade program, if you're you're charging extra for it. But the problem in the long term is this: a lot of those programs I just mentioned, you need a specialty instructor to teach, which means all of a sudden your business becomes reliant on that instructor staying. Because when that instructor leaves, it means that most likely you're gonna to have to cancel that program. The, the other problem with this is some school owners will be the only ones that actually know how to run these programs. So for example, you, you add a weapons program into your, uh, your business, but you're the only one proficient enough to teach the weapons class. Now all of a sudden the entire business is relying on you. So when you're sick, guess what? There's no weapons class. Okay, when you wanna go on vacation, Guess what, there's no weapons class. So while these things may add some short-term value, long-term, they're really hard to scale, okay? It's really hard to end up getting freedom from your, true freedom from your business when you become so reliant on an individual to run each one of these programs. And guys, I'm telling you this from experience as well. Like we, we, have a, we still have a tricking program at our uh, first location don't know how long it's going to last for it's probably not going to last very long but it's completely reliant on having an instructor that can teach tricking and jump kicks and flips so i don't want to teach that class i don't want to have to have all my other instructors become proficient in tricking so we're fortunate right now that we have someone able to teach that class but it's not going to be a scalable program we're not putting it into any of our future locations because we know it's not a scalable program and that goes back to me launching that program when i first took over the school and not thinking about the long-term effect of those things. So at some point, will we be getting rid of it? Absolutely, because I don't want any class to be reliant on one specific individual. Okay, continuing on. Number two for false profits. Oh, I'm gonna get some slack from this. Paid in full memberships or cashing out your members, okay? So paid in full is when instead of uh, collecting a monthly recurring revenue, you're taking on the full uh, payment up front. Um, I'm gonna add a little asterisk and disclaimer to this. If you are extremely, extremely disciplined with your finances, and you, if you have a business partner, they're also very disciplined with finances, 
you might be able to get away with doing pay in fulls because you can keep it in the bank account and just pull out the monthly withdrawal for those memberships of the people that paid in full. Um, but here's the problem with paid in full is most people running businesses are not financially disciplined, which means they get that giant chunk of money for the pay in full and then they use it to spend on whatever. Okay. Typical is in every business when revenue increases, guess what else increases? Spending increases as well. And a lot of times when you're collecting big payments up front, you see people spending that money immediately. Okay. And they're spending money they they haven't yet earned. All right. Yes, you got it paid, but that you haven't fulfilled that person's 12 months, 24 months, whatever they, they signed up for. So if you haven't fulfilled on the promise, don't be spending that money. Okay. Put that money to the side and gradually pull. We don't actually offer pay and fulls at all at our school, except we'll offer two of them at our holiday sale. And that's the only time we offer it. And it's typically the same two people that come in and do it. Uh, we don't give any discount. We add uh, extra month to their membership when they pay in full for a year and that's it. And we only do it to those for two people at the holiday sale. And then once those two people pay in full, we don't accept any more. Uh, the reason is, is we want to have consistent income so we can have consistent budgeting and we can forecast things much easier. Okay. So for us, it's all about recurring revenue. Also the multiple, if you ever want to exit your business, the multiple you get on recurring revenue is much bigger than the multiple you're going to get on a pay in full. So just something to keep in mind, but I love recurring revenue. Uh, all my businesses are based around consistent recurring revenue. I've done the pay in full model before and the pay in full model is so stressful on your staff because everyone is chasing to make sure that you can pay bills because you have to collect X number of pay in fulls in order to be able to pay bills. When instead, when you increase your billing, then it's just adding new billing every month. Okay. You're not as stressed to get a giant payment from someone. Uh, it's less pressured sales and, and all of that. But the, the other problem with paying fulls is a lot of y'all that are offering paying fulls, you're discounting your program below profit margins. So here's what I mean by that. If we think that the average martial arts or fitness studio, and I'm saying average, not good ones, average, is 15% profit margins, one five, okay? If we think it's a 15% profit margin, I see people offering 10% off paying fulls which means now you just cut your profit margin on those pay and fulls down to 5%. Well, then there's the, the other argument, right? Well, Adam, if uh, I'm getting to pay for a year and most of my students only uh, last six months, I'm actually getting six months extra that I wouldn't normally get. Yeah, that's great if you have no integrity and you don't care about improving your program so people last longer than six months. It's a cop out in my, <laughs> in my opinion. Instead, I think we need to focus on Hey, how do we increase the service so they want to stay 12 months or they want to stay 14 months or two years or however long? How do we do better on our end instead of just trying to trick people into paying in full so they have to stay longer because they already made the commitment? So I'm just giving you guys my opinion on this. I'm against paying fulls um, uh, just because they're going to eat into your profit margin and then most people are not financially disciplined enough to not spend that money and keep it in a bank. Just my two cents on that. Um, and then third is going to be sales and discounts in general. Um, offering family discounts, uh, same same issue with a lot of this, guys. Uh, when you're offering family discounts at your school, okay, a lot of you guys are cutting out the profit of your membership. I can't tell you how many times I'll sit down with school owners and I'll, I'll have them show me their numbers and then we'll look and figure out what their profit margins is, are and they're like at 10 or 15%. And then we see that they're giving like 10% off for the first family, family member, 15% off for the second, 15. And they're like, well, if, if the family trains together, they're gonna stay longer. Yeah, cool, you're gonna have uh, people staying longer that you're making zero profit off of because you're discounting the family membership so much. So what's the point of having them stay longer if, if it's not generating any profit in your business? So for us, we don't do any family discounts, okay? You pay full price for each person. Okay, and for most kids, sports and activities, it's the same way. I have three boys. If I sign up all three of them for an activity, guess what? 99% of the time, I'm paying full, pi full price for all three of them. But I think what happens in our industry is there's this mindset where the school owner is looking at the price and then they're like, well, I couldn't afford this for my family, so I wanna give a discount to make it more affordable for families everywhere. That's injecting yourself and your emotions into the business. Just because you own the business doesn't mean that you are the ideal target demographic for your own business. 
Let me say that again. Just because you own the business or you work in the business does not make it so you are the target demographic for your business. Your target demographic should be someone that can afford to sign up both their kids full price and not have to worry about a discount. All right, your target demographic should be different. That's why it's so important to know who your ideal customer avatar is. Knowing what's their household income? How many kids do they have? What type of places do they shop at? Uh, who do they follow for advice on social media? Like all of those things, you should have an ideal customer avatar. And then knowing that makes you much more confident when you're pricing out your program because you know what the average household in income is of your target person. You know where they spend money on other things. Like for example, our target demographic, one of the places that they shop besides Target is Lululemon. Like if you walk into our school, you will see a ridiculous amount of moms wearing Lululemon in the stands. Uh, of our martial arts school. We know they're willing to spend $140 on a pair of leggings. I think we're discounting our tuition when they're gonna spend full price on a pair of leggings for $140? Hell no. Uh, know your audience though, know, know your target demographic and make sure that you're not pricing yourself or discounting yourself out of profit, all right? I'm okay having sales once in a while, all right? I think it's good for the retail side of the business, all right? I'm okay for having a 50% offer on trial memberships once in a while, okay? But you need to get out of the habit of doing 50% off of trial memberships all the time because otherwise what you're gonna uh, attract is the group honors, the discounters, the people that don't like paying full price for anything, okay? We saw this happen while I was at I Love Kickboxing. It literally, if you Google search discount fitness, the number one thing that came up was I Love Kickboxing when I worked there. I don't know if it's changed now, but part of the reason was whenever there was marketing done for their, their trial memberships, it was always done like 50% off our trial membership, 75% off trial membership. It was always a discount off the trial membership. So what happened was they were attracting people that always looked for discounts, that always looked for savings. And then it became harder to grow and sign up people at each location because they had discount hunters coming in. Okay, and the people that didn't wanna pay full price for anything. So just be careful with that for your own facilities. Uh, we don't want you to be the discount martial arts center. We want you to be able to earn a living. We want you to be able to pay your uh, staff a, a good wage so that they can build their own legacy and provide future opportunities for them, right? So we, we talked about those three forms of false profits, okay? Which, which again, we're just adding on more things, uh, doing pay in fulls, and then over discounting or over overdoing it on sales where you're cutting yourself out of profit margins. So let's talk about the type of profits I do like. I call these predictive profits, okay? Because predictive profits, you're able to sort of gauge and plan where the growth is gonna happen according to these metrics. So number one, obvious one for all of us is new member acquisition, okay? So we can grow our profit by adding new members because we know that by signing up more people, it's gonna increase billing. Okay, as long as we're keeping the back door closed and not letting more people leave than we have coming in, right? So we have to increase that net billing. Okay, number two is increasing your arm. Okay, not this arm, but average revenue per member, arm. Okay, average revenue per member. So your average revenue per member is figured out by taking your gross revenue and dividing it by your student count. Okay, ideally, you wanna be close to $300 average revenue per member. The, the old school way of thinking that still is everywhere in this industry is number of students, okay? I hear people, uh, I'll meet with them the first time, like, what's some of your goals? They're like, I wanna have 500 students. And I go, why? And they don't have a reason for why they want 500 students. For me, I would rather have a martial arts school with 300 students that has an average revenue per member of $300, so, less students, more revenue per member, than a school with 500 students that's also doing $90,000 per month. Because now I need more staffing, which means more overhead, which means less profit to service those 500 people when I can probably provide better service to less members and charge them more for it, if that makes sense. So your average revenue per member is super important. Um, I think it's more important than student count Okay, obviously you need a good amount of students and a high average revenue per member, but too much focus in our industry is on how many students you wanna have or how many students you have and all of that stuff. Hey, I'd rather have less students than my competitor and be making more money than them 
then more students making less money. I think all of you guys would agree with that, right? So increasing your average revenue per member, we're, we're gonna give you guys some tactics on this podcast today on how to do that. Uh, and then the third part of this is operations optimization. Okay, so which is essentially taking the things that you're already doing and making them more efficient and making them better. Okay, whether it's increasing lead to trial, whether it's increasing trial to appointment or appointment to show up or show up to new member. Okay, optimizing those different processes so we become more efficient and add more members that way or add more upgrades and increase our, our arm that way. Um, but those are the, the three predictive profits. So what I mean by this is when we're looking at our revenue goals for our business, really for any of the businesses, those are the three things we're thinking about, right? So how are we getting new members this month? What are we doing to increase the average revenue per member? And then what systems and practice, uh, processes are we improving? and making better and making more efficient to drive up our, our numbers. And if you're the manager, the CEO of your business, every time you're talking about goals, you should be thinking about these three things. How are we adding new members this month? How are we increasing the average revenue per member? And then lastly, what are we doing to improve what we've already been doing when it comes to systems and processes? All right, so let's jump into this. So new member acquisition strategies. Um, there are so many of these in our industry, which is a great thing to have. Okay, so I'm gonna sort of whittle this down to a few. Uh, Google ads and Facebook ads are where you wanna be right now. TikTok is still a little bit far away in my opinion, but Google and Facebook, you guys wanna be on top of those. You wanna make sure that you have uh, either smart ads running on Google or Performance Max. Uh, I love the Performance Max campaigns that Google allows you to run. Okay, and then what I found in my opinion is Having Facebook and Google running at the same time superpowers both. And then what we'll do is we'll typically cut Google for a little bit and then all of a sudden we'll see Facebook's leads improve and then we go back to doing them again. And there's something just about people seeing you everywhere. We want them seeing us when they're on Facebook, but we also want them to see us when they're just randomly on Google sites, uh, when they're doing searches for us, all of that stuff. So if you're not using Google ads, uh, I would get on that because I think most of your competition is probably only focused on Facebook right now. Okay, which for uh, a lot of you guys, Google is a blue ocean, meaning that Facebook, there's a bunch of blood in the water because everyone is hunting on Facebook. But Google, you might be the only person in your area hunting for fish, which means you got a wide open blue ocean with no competition on Google right now. Um, we did uh, a comparison study for Google and Facebook. Uh, and between both of those, uh, we ran multiple campaigns for four months. Okay, lead cost on Google using performance max campaigns was about $13 per lead, where Facebook was about $38 per lead for our facility. Uh, the other positive of making sure that we're, uh, making sure that, that Google is, is doing really well is that our Google campaign, we had the same campaign running for about four months, whereas Facebook, we had four different campaigns running over that four month uh, period. So Google is a little bit more hands-off in the sense that their algorithm is smarter in my opinion, um, where Facebook, you can get great results, but it needs constant hand-holding, okay? Whereas Google's sort of a, a set it, check it once in a month and you're good um, if, if you're running them yourselves. Obviously, if you're working with the agency, like uh, our agency clients, their media buyers are checking their ads daily and something to report daily. Um, but even if you run it on your own, and you want a little hassle, more hassle-free way to run ads, I would, I would say go with Google over Facebook. Um, if you're willing to be dedicated to checking your Facebook ads every other day at least, then stick with Facebook. Um, the other thing I wanna talk about when it comes to new member acquisition is a lot of us go for knockouts right away when it comes to lead acquisition, which, which means that we're just focusing on getting someone to purchase like immediately when we're doing any type of marketing. And that's the only metric that we use to judge if this campaign worked or not. In most cases, it takes people three to six months to make a decision to purchase, okay? We, back in the day, there was this Harvard study in 1970 that said the average person needs to see your branding seven times before they make a purchase, okay? But that seven times number was from a 1970s Harvard study. It's a bit outdated, wouldn't you agree? Google now estimates it's about 500 touch points someone needs before they make a purchase, which means even if I'm running an ad this month, they're probably not seeing anything of mine 500 times this month and make, making a purchase, okay? This is a three to six month process. So if you're running marketing right now, 
most likely that marketing is paying off in three to six months, okay, depending on the initial price point and your, your overall brand awareness, it's taking three to six months for that purchase to actually come through. So when we're thinking about that side of it, we can't just be asking for the sale all the time. Okay, so what we teach our clients is we call it the, the jabs, the crosses, and the knockouts. Okay, and we segment all of the lead generating um, uh, policies and, and uh, events into those three sections. So it's either a jab, a cross, or a knockout. So a jab is considered something that you're not gonna see an immediate return on but it is gonna get you in front of people, okay? So that might be something just doing brand awareness campaigns. Uh, it might be uh, donating to like a, a local little league or, or sponsoring uh, something local in your community, okay? Where those things, I'm probably not gonna get a student immediately from those things, okay? But is it getting my business out there in front of more people? Absolutely, okay? Am I connecting more with the community? Absolutely, okay? Being a guest on a podcast, probably the same exact thing, right? You're gonna get in front of people, you're gonna build brand awareness. Most likely you're not gonna get direct uh, members from being on someone else's podcast, okay? But these things are important because it's fulfilling those 500 touch points. We're getting in front of people, okay? We're getting our face in front of people to make sure that they're actually seeing us and making sure that they're familiar and building trust with our brand before we ask them to make a purchase, okay? And then we also have things like the crosses, the crosses are gonna be more direct asks. You'll probably see a bit more immediate purchases or, or uh, trials as a result of the crosses, but you can't expect it to completely fill up your schedule. You can't expect to completely fill up um, what's going on in your uh, school today, okay? So for example, one of those might be like uh, your referral program in your business. Okay, a lot of us will only talk about a referral program once when we need referrals, instead of having it be constant education within your facility. So at some point they're having a conversation in the future with a friend and all of a sudden it clicks with them about the referral program. Oh, I get $100 cash if this person joins. Plus I know it's gonna be good for them and they're gonna enjoy it. Now let me talk to them to get them in the door. Okay, but instead most business owners are only talking about referrals when they need members. Okay, it has to be consistent education with those things. So when the opportunity provides itself, it's just an easy transition to someone joining your program. Um, the last category is knockout. So these are the things that when you do them, if the jabs and crosses are happening, you get immediate results from these knockouts. So the knockouts on my list that I have are uh, text message database reactivation campaigns. We do this once a quarter where we message out to all of our leads we have in our system that have not purchased a trial and we give them a free seven or 10 day pass. Okay, we do it through text messaging. We always get in the high teens for appointments to low 20s. So we'll get anywhere from like 16 appointments to 24 appointments, figure about 90% show up rate because uh, it's a free offer for kids, but then we're still getting 85% on enrollment. So we usually, every time we run this campaign, we get immediate enrollments of like around 15 or more people for that month. So that's a no brain campaign. Um, doing 24 to 48 flash uh, hour flash sale on trials, doing email with tech support. So we'll do a 24 special where we email it out to our entire list that we're doing 50% off of our trial membership for that day. Again, I wouldn't do this more than once a quarter because you don't want to become a discount school, right? But doing these short 24 hour flash sales are great to get immediate trial purchases. Okay, doing three week or six week class sessions at schools or preschools. We go in maybe every Wednesday, uh, you teach the after school portion for the day, and then you set up a graduation at the end of the three weeks or the end of the six weeks, uh, where it's a graduation and pizza party at your school where all the families come of the kids. Uh, you have the kids perform the things that they learned. They break a board, they earn their first belt. You get pizza to all the kids, and while the kids are eating pizza, you're pitching the parents and doing sort of like a mass intro to get all of them enrolled. Uh, free community events kill it for us for immediate trials. So like Easter egg hunt, trunk or treat, pictures with Santa, um, those things always get us immediate trials. Again, we're usually in the middle to low 20s for number of trials we sell in a day at those events. So those things are great. And then Facebook, Google, and TikTok ads um, are also part of our knockout formula. But if you're not posting regularly, okay, you're not gonna get many knockouts. You're not gonna get many trial purchases when it comes to digital marketing. You have to be posting and boosting posts regularly, which will help you to get more engagement uh, and, and more action on your ads that you're running. Also, uh, if you guys are just throwing ads up with no other like 
campaigns to get views, to do brand awareness, stuff like that, it's gonna become harder than to actually get people to follow through and purchase as well. All right, so we talked about knockouts um, and we talked about our jab, jab, cross. Let's talk about growing our arm. Um, so I'm gonna use my school as an example, okay? Uh, at the point of putting these numbers together, we are at 321 students doing 70,000 a month, okay? So 321 students, 70,000 a month. That creates an arm of $211 per member, okay? So again, 321 students, 70,000. You take 70,000 divided by 321, you get $211, okay? So how do we raise our arm? So let's go over a few different options. So option number one is you raise rates for new members, not existing, but for new members, okay? So let's say you're currently at 209 per month and let's say you wanna raise it to 229 per month, okay? A lot of us have a limiting belief about raising our uh, prices for new members because we think we're gonna get more no's. Okay, I've proven that wrong over and over again in the sense that we have that 85% for day one enrollment percentage consistently from when we were charging 119 a month to now when we're charging 249 per month. So if you're saying that jacking up the price for new members is gonna kill your closing percentage, it's only gonna kill your closing percentage if you believe it's gonna kill your closing percentage. It won't, okay? But let's say you raise your rates for new members from 209 to 229 per month, okay? automatically you're gonna be increasing your arm because you're gonna be losing people at the old rate, gaining people at the new rate. So let's say worst case scenario, you raise your rates and you have 15 enrollments in a month at 229, but then you also lose 15 students at 209. Normally this would end up being a wash. Okay, in this case, you're still gonna be up $300 in billing for losing the exact same number of people because you did a price increase of $20 per month, okay? so. Worst case scenario, you can lose and gain the same amount of people and you're still gonna see upward momentum happening for a little bit. And then over time, think about this in the time, time span of a year or two years, okay? Your entire average revenue per member is gonna consistently increase because you're constantly gonna be losing people at the old rate, gaining people at the new rate, ideally. Okay, option two for this is increasing your current prices across the board. Adam, I can't increase my current prices. Those people have been with me forever. Yeah, and they've been rewarded forever because they're paying the lowest price possible that you've ever charged. So here's what we did. We had uh, $60,000 in billing and we did a 10% price increase across the board for all of our members. Okay, we sent this out an email form. We sent out text message supports for them to read their emails. Okay, guess how many people quit because we raised our prices? Boom, zero. 10% across, uh, across the board we raised. So 10% across the board with $60,000 in billing, we instantly added $6,000 in billing literally overnight by doing a uh, rate increase for all of our old members. Okay, and the, the couple of keys to this is when you do the rate increase, okay, the 10% increase should keep them still lower than whatever your current new member rates are, okay? I don't believe in raising them to the same rates as your new members because again, they have been there for a while. I still think there should be some loyalty to them signing up uh, before maybe proof of concept was there and before your school is full, okay? So if you're doing a price increase on your old members, I would also at the same time increase the rates for new incoming members, okay? So that way you can show that, hey, to your old members, even though we're increasing prices by 10%, you're still gonna be paying lower than a new member that joins us because they are at this rate, okay? The way we did this is we did it very manual in the sense that, we had an email template that we used, and then we put for each person we sent it to, we said, hey, this is your current rate. This is gonna be your new rate as of whatever date we instituted the rate. But good news is you're still lower than our current member rate of boom, okay? Which, so that way they're seeing the adjustment of what they will be at with the 10% discount, and then we're reaffirming that, hey, you're still getting a good deal because you're X number of dollars lower than what new members would pay when they join. So if we take, Going back to our school, we take that $70,000 gross revenue, okay? We just added a $6,000 billing increase. So now, by sending out a couple of emails and text messages, we've gone from 70,000 revenue to 76,000 gross revenue, okay, using the scenario, all right? Which means we've also increased the new average revenue per member from 211 to $229, just by doing a 10% price increase across the board. Okay, now what if you lose members doing this, all right? 
So let's say when we instituted this, let's say we had 10 members quit, okay, which wasn't the case, but let's just play a game with me for a second. We had 10 members quit at the rate of 211, okay, which is our old arm. Okay, that means we'd be losing $2,110. But if we think about this, we're, we had an overall uh, billing increase of 6,000. So let's just subtract that $2,110 uh, we lost. Okay, we still are up $3,890 in billing by doing a 10% uh, across the board price increase. Okay, so increasing the prices across the board, even if you lose 10 students, you're still up on overall revenue and overall monthly billing. Okay, so whatever fear you have going into it, if you might lose students, okay, and I'm not saying that you might not, but do the math on it. It's most likely still gonna make sense even if you lose 10 members after you do your price increase. Okay, next part that's really simple, and I've talked about this in previous episode, have a 5% annual increase in all of your contracts so you never have to raise prices again in the future for existing members. Okay, you have this, so every 12 months when their uh, contract renews, Okay, or when they get to the 12 month, month point of view, month to month, okay, there's a 5% annual increase. Okay, so their, their rates go up 5% every 12 months. This is something the fitness industry does over and over and over again, something that every martial arts school should be doing as well. It is easy, easy money, and it's an adjustment for inflation as well, um, which if you think about it, the 5% doesn't even meet inflation where we're at right now, but hopefully inflation will go down and then you'll, you'll be right on with that 5%. Okay, so let's let's look at optimization now, right? So how do we stretch our dollar far, farther for the money we're already spending on leads? Okay, if we wanna increase revenue, and maybe I don't have an increased budget to spend to put into advertising or put into marketing to get new members that way, okay, what we can do is we can look at what we're doing, and as long as we're tracking our metrics, we can make adjustments. So for example, if you look at the number of leads that you get per month and how many of those convert into trial memberships or first lessons, okay, if you're doing free uh, free trials, look at how many of those convert to first lessons. If it's below 50%, okay, most likely there's some things that you can be doing different to get those people to, to convert. So maybe it's just you need to build more rapport and you're gonna change the first text message th that goes out to be a selfie of one of your instructors so they can put a face with who they're talking to. Maybe it's you're going to get better at your text messaging interaction with your leads. So you're going to do better at using emojis. You're going to do better at ending every single text message with a question to keep the conversation going. Okay. Maybe it's looking at your sales process. Maybe you're only converting 50% of the people that walk in into, into brand new memberships. Right. That, that number should be 85%. Okay. Whether you're running ads or not should be at least 85%. So maybe it's going through and looking at your sales process and reevaluating your sales process and seeing where, where that is broken. Right. Those are all optimizations that you guys can make in your business to increase revenue, okay? They're all done through optimization. It's not done through spending more money or anything like that. You're just looking at what you're doing already, seeing how you can make it better. Maybe your upgrade program, you're not getting enough people into it, okay? Maybe you have a small class size. Well, let's look at how we're inviting people into our upgrade program and how the process goes to actually get them enrolled, all right? Are we doing everything that we can consistently and correctly? Or are there improvements that we can make to this process to make it a more special process to improve the numbers in this process as well okay the one of the last parts of increasing revenue that gets missed the most often the most often is planning ahead for your revenue you have to have a blueprint for the year on how you're going to generate revenue every month so one thing that we do is every december we sit down with our clients and we plan out the whole year okay so we go month by month okay we make sure we have a few things in place Number one, what's our marketing strategy for new members? Number two, what is our uh, retention strategy to keep members? Okay, and then number three, what is our uh, strategy for uh, building up the community? So the community within your school. So what are we doing to harbor community? So a couple of things that we're gonna do is we make sure that every month we have at least one revenue generating event. We also make sure every month we have one lead generating event. Okay, and then we make sure that quarterly, we have community building events for our members, right? Which are usually a free event or some sort of outing that we do uh, where we, we host it for our members that where they can just come in, hang out, socialize, make friends type of thing. So we go and plan that out throughout the whole year. Then we go back and we say, all right, for each month, let's figure out how are we generating leads uh, either within the community or online? Are there events we're having booths at? Uh, are we doing digital and paid marketing every single month? Are we switching up the offers at certain times of the year to take advantage of 
whatever uh, specials we can be doing according to Black Friday or according to Memorial Day or whatever, whatever is going on, right? And we plan all of that out in advance. So now that we have a plan, we know how to execute. Okay, the, the equivalent of this on the martial arts side would be you opening up a martial arts school, knowing, having no plan of what curriculum is needed for each, each belt what, uh, or each rank or each season or whatever. No idea what the curriculum is, but you're just showing up every day and teaching random stuff. That's the equivalent of doing this in the martial arts side. If you want to be a great business owner and you want to see growth in your business, you have to plan it out ahead of time. Okay, you have to have a blueprint in place for how you're going to generate the revenue you want, how you're going to generate the opportunities that you want in your business, and how you're going to keep students falling in love with martial arts over and over and over again. We'll do another podcast just on retention strategies, okay? Because I think we have some of the best in the industry. Um, we're consistently under 4% attrition at our own school, okay? And we're teaching these same strategies to our clients who are having great success with it as well. So we'll teach you guys some of the things that we're using that's absolutely crushing it for retention and really getting not only your students more bought in, but becoming raving fans of your business, which I know people talk about that all the time, but legit raving fans in the sense that they're posting about your school online. Okay, they're talking to their friends about your school. You have consistent referrals coming in, all of those things. So we'll jump onto that into another podcast. This one was shorter today, guys, but I just want to give you guys some quick things that you guys can put in place to really uh, kick ass with revenue generation in your school. Um, and one thing I would encourage you guys to do, we do this for our mastermind clients, but something that you guys should do for yourself is create a list of every lead generating activity you can do so that you can always go back and reference it at any time when you guys are struggling to come up with leads or struggling to come up with ways to generate more revenue in your business. Hope you guys had fun today. Hope you got some good notes. We'll see you on the next episode.